Hi guys, so today's video is going to be a non-spoiler book review and then at the very end a little bit of a spoilery chat for the Grisha Trilogy by Lee Bartugo. I do have individual book reviews and chats for the first two, so I'll have those linked down below if you're wanting to get into spoilers and more in-depth thoughts for those ones specifically, but jumping into it, this is a very popular young adult fantasy series that has a lot of mixed reviews. It's one of those series that I think was very loved and popular for a while, and then when it really got popular, you started to see a little bit of backlash, which I think is very common because when something gets praised a lot, then when somebody goes into it, perhaps their expectations have been raised a little high, almost unrealistically high, and then they get into it and it's not what they were hoping for. As much as possible, I'm going to try and ensure that everything I tell you about in the non-spoiler portion is as straight to the point as I can possibly have it be because I don't want anybody going in with unrealistic expectations. I personally, this was a reread for me, and the first time I remember liking it, but then it had been a while and I was just like, would I like this as much if I went back and reread it? So I went back and reread it and I actually loved it <laughs> the second time around. I liked it way more than I did the first time. We follow a young girl named Alina, who at the very beginning of the story discovers that she may have this power that only one individual is supposed to have that can save her home country of Ravka from the Shadowfold. The Shadowfold is something that this individual known as the Darkling created years and years ago, and it's just shrouded in darkness. There are all these monsters there. It's pretty much uninhabitable. It's very difficult to cross through, and as a result, it's put a huge strain on her country. It makes it very difficult for trade to happen. It makes it very difficult for travel to happen. All in all, it's kind of a big deal. They need to take care of it. And there is this individual who the prophecies say will rid Ravka of the Shadowfold. This person is known as the Sun Summoner, and Alina, at the beginning of the story, shows signs of having this power. Until this point, her life has been pretty understated. She's just a simple orphan girl who has her friend Mal. It's her best friend that she's kind of also in love with. And that's it. That's all her life really is made up of. She's young. She doesn't have a lot to call her own. She doesn't have a ton of agency. She sees herself as plain. She sees herself as unimportant. She also kind of finds herself very often in her best friend's shadow. He's very charismatic. He gets along with everybody. And so she just kind of almost is attached to him in an unhealthy way. She doesn't really know herself without him, how to identify herself without him. And then Alina's whole world gets flipped upside down when she has these possible powers. She gets whisked off to the little palace, which is this place where they train individuals known as Grisha, who have varying different powers. It's very much a fish out of water situation. As soon as Alina arrives, she finds that at first she was thinking, maybe I'll finally find my place because I'll be surrounded by people who are also like me in a sense, but instead she once again is finding herself feeling lonely and like she doesn't fit in because everybody's been at this school for so long and she's this newcomer and she has this power that supposedly is gonna save the world and this creates a lot of tension. Some people immediately value her way more than they should. Some people are standoffish of her or hate her because she gets way more attention from other people, including the current Darkling. I mentioned before that the Darkling supposedly is the one that created the Shadowfold, but there has always been a Darkling, and this generation's current Darkling is this mysterious man who has this power associated with shadows, and he's kind of like the contrast to Alina's power with light. He's also the representative of the Grisha, he leads their army, and there's a lot of political things going on with him, and he does give Alina a lot of attention because he thinks and fills her head with all these ideas of saving the world. And she just is a nobody. That's how she's always viewed herself. She doesn't feel like she fits in anywhere. This one person is telling her, no, you're worth a lot. You have so much to offer the world. You're going to save the world. You're going to stand side by side with me. So likely, just in the way I've described this story, probably picking up on a few pretty familiar tropes, one of which being the chosen one trope and also special snowflake. And then you're also dealing with a character who's 
very insecure about themselves. They don't feel like they have any confidence. They just view themselves in a way that's quite negative. But then you'll start to see other people telling them, no, you're amazing. <laughs> and that's definitely something that young adults especially young adult fantasy has been picked on for, where you have these characters that are like, I'm plain Jane. And then everybody's like, you're the most amazing person ever. And then as the reader, you're like, well, are they a plain Jane? It can feel like this character is a little bland. It doesn't have a ton of personality. And then all of a sudden, everybody's really invested in them. In this particular case, invested in them for something <laughs> completely outside of their control and their personality, those sorts of things. However, despite the fact that they think it is true that there's a special snowflake trope, it is true it's a chosen one trope, I actually personally don't mind those elements of the story where the character feels very insecure because I think it's something that a lot of individuals can relate to. Also, I think nowadays a lot of times people enjoy books that aren't necessarily written for their demographic. So, for example, I'm 27 years old. I don't necessarily identify with the things that Alina is going through at this time in my life, but I can definitely think about a time in my life when I felt very lonely or that I felt like I didn't fit in with any particular group. And those elements of the story I actually appreciate because it is marketed toward a younger audience. And I think that not to say you can't relate to those things later in life, but I do think this self-discovery and valuing yourself a little bit more, I think a lot of young people go through that. And so for that reason, it doesn't really bother me, but it is present in the story. And if you're not a fan of that, yeah, it is probably gonna annoy you. I do appreciate though that throughout the series, you do see Alina grow significantly. She, at the beginning, is just bumbling around, <laughs> having no idea what to do about anything. And I don't blame her because I also feel like I wouldn't know what the heck I'm supposed to do if I was thrown into the middle of not only supposedly this mission of saving the world, but the politics that are involved because the Darkling, his role is so strongly intertwined with the royalty. You see a lot of politics going on and she has no idea how to navigate that. So I found that in the beginning, you see her kind of clueless, not knowing what to do. And then as the story progresses, while she internally feels like she's still not sure how she fits in with all this, she's starting to play the part. She is very gullible initially. She trusts maybe too easily. And as the story progresses, you see her starting to maybe gain some intuition, to become a little more suspicious of people, to not always rely on what other people are telling her, but to make decisions for herself. It is first person narration, so you're following her, you're in her head throughout the entirety of the story with the exception of the prologues and the epilogues, but essentially you're just following Alina and you're in her head. One thing that I think upon rereading it that I actually would have been fascinated with is if we could have occasionally gotten the other perspectives of characters that show up. Regardless, we do just get the story through Alina's eyes and Alina is so young and she is she is so clueless initially and so as a result you're gonna find that a lot of times the writing it's it's fairly straightforward. I do think Bardugo does a quite good job of making you feel grounded in their world, making you feel like you're there with the characters. And I do think that she has the side characters all have fairly distinct personalities, but I wouldn't say that the descriptions are the most lush, beautiful things you're ever gonna read. I wouldn't say it's poetic in its writing style. It is pretty straightforward. All in all, I think that this particular trilogy is a fantastic starting point for somebody who's just wanting to get into fantasy, especially if that somebody is a younger reader. I just think, I think it does a lot of what I like in fantasy. It can show you the way in which people have to struggle through something very difficult. The stakes are raised from book to book. You get these magical elements tied in. You have this different world that I think Bardugo did a fantastic job creating. Yes, some of the tropes are a little youthful in nature. Yes, the writing style is a little bit more straightforward. But all in all, I think that it's, you know, I think it's a pretty good starting place. And I also just think it was an enjoyable time. I enjoyed it 
throughout, although I do think that some of the tropes throughout the story are gonna be off-putting for people who don't like those tropes. I am going to jump into some spoilers for this last book, so if you don't want any spoilers, make sure to click off. But anyway, getting into some spoilers for this one. I would love to know, for those of you that hate the ending of the series, why exactly you hate the ending? Because when I reread it, I was like, that was a great ending. I loved it. One thing I have seen people, I've seen a couple things people complain about. One is that the ending is too happy, that they were like Mal should have died or Alina should have died. Things were just perfectly wrapped up and you're welcome to feel that way. I'm not telling you you're wrong. I just don't agree necessarily because in the end, Alina finally got to have this power and feel like the, the power that she has by being a sun summoner has become so much a part of her and then she loses it. And you see in the epilogue that there are many times that she kind of starts to lose herself in sadness thinking about this part of her that she has lost. She's not really full the way she was before. She doesn't feel whole. And so I think in that way, it, it is bittersweet. It's certainly happier than if Mal had actually died but I don't think it's the absolute perfect happily ever after. The same goes for Mal. I see a lot of people that are like, Mal only loved her when she lost her powers. And I'm like, Mal loves her like the whole time when they were best friends. There's a part in the story toward the end, right before they think he's gonna have to die. And he, she asks him like, did you ever really think of me that way before? And he gets all embarrassed because he's like, I did, but you were my best friend. I felt like I wasn't supposed to think of you that way. For a long time, he was just trekking on as a soldier. And then Alina, their lives come together again, and he just gives up everything to go find her and protect her. And then they try to run away. That doesn't work. And he actually has the opportunity to just leave in the second book. He can leave and go live his life, but he stays by her side and she expects him to. That's what I didn't really, it's not like I didn't catch it the first time, but I feel like I didn't really, I didn't really drink it in the first time the way I did this time, is that in that second book, she's finding herself just expecting Mal to stay. And she's like, well, but Mal loves me. Like, he'll stay, won't he? And I don't know, you think about in real, in real life, <laughs> when couples have different dreams, sometimes it ends up resulting in they go their separate ways because the dream that one has is the same as the dream the other has. And I feel like Mal gave up his dream. He gave up his freedom. He gave up everything to be there for her. And then during all of that, he has to sit and watch as she's courted by this prince and as she's expected to become queen. And that's kind of the, the territory that they then have to navigate is he is expected to be there and then watch her leave. He knows that Alina is quote unquote, meant for better things and bigger things than him. And he is resolved in that fact. And it's like, it's sad. You kind of get, I got why he was grumpy this time around. I was like, man, it's annoying for sure, but I kind of get it. Back to the original point though of the whole Mal, does he only love her when she loses her power? I just feel like there's so many indications throughout the book that he does love her, that he's given up a lot for her. And yeah, at the end, he, he tells her, I, there were times that I did hate your power, but this is never what I wanted. He didn't want her to feel miserable and not have this piece of herself anymore. He just wanted the, he wanted to be with her. I feel like that's all it really came down to is that he knew she was meant for something bigger and he was okay with that to an extent because it's what had to be, but he still loved her. Like, I don't know. I just, I just don't interpret it that way, but... Oh man, I'm a little nervous. I want to add to, man, sorry, this is turning into like a Mal character examination, but I just want to add that Alina, I'm not trying to compare the things they lost and saying like, one's harder for the, than the other, but Alina discovers this power that she has, embraces it, learns to love it, and then loses it. And yes, it's very tragic. Mal didn't even realize this part of himself that he has always identified with was actually magical in nature, this whole ability to track. So S Alina suppressed her power for so long, but he always had it. He always had it. And that was like a big thing. He was the tracker. Oh yeah, this guy, this one soldier I was with one time, this guy could track anything. That was his thing. 
And then in the end, he loses that ability too. It's they both lost something, but but they get to be together. That's what I mean. I'm not I'm not saying like that's all the story is. Uh, that's all it is. It's this love story between the two of them. I'm just saying that because that's the part that a lot of people end up having such differing opinions on. That's why I'm spending so much time on it in the spoilers. But you know, I don't know. I just feel like it's bittersweet. They both lost so much but in the end, they have each other. Anyway, I would love to know your thoughts on this story, whatever you want to chat about. I know there's so much more to it than I elaborated on, but I just feel like I've yammered on for way too long. So I'm just going to cut myself off here. If you want to chat spoilers, please, 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 please remember to write spoilers. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you guys later. Mm -hmm.